Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Search Podcast. So for today's episode, uh, I wanted to talk about pediatric injury patterns and sort of, I would say that the scope of this audience would probably be either uh, adult guys dealing with kids or kids trying to understand how adult guys would deal with the situation, either in the resuscitation room or outside the resuscitation room. So right off the bat, um, children aren't just tiny adults. So the the per dose, the sort of per weight dosage that's uh, traditionally thought of as the main thing, uh, quote unquote, that you need to know in pediatrics is sort of the tip of the iceberg. There are certain other things that come into play when it comes to trauma. And I was hoping to sort of work on that a little bit more today. Uh, just um, some ground rules or things that you need to know uh, coming from a more adult population. In general, between uh, 10 and 20% of the patients that you're going to see, up to 30% in uh, civilian trauma settings will be kids. And uh, you won't know the dosages. So buy a Breslow tape. What a Breslow tape is, is it's basically a tape measure that looks at the height of the uh, patient and tells you the most important medications that you would need uh, for uh, PALS and uh, for uh, sort of ATLS, if you will. The general differences are that uh, the number one cause of mortality is the brain in kids. And th- I'll try and do a whole talk on neuroimaging and when to scan kids because missed injuries also. The number one missed injury is skull fractures and um, bleeding, intracranial hemorrhages, right? That's the most that's been reported in the literature. And we'll talk about that a little bit more a little bit later. But the other thing that you need to understand is that the amount of force that's being driven into the kid from any mechanism is the same as there would be in an adult. But the key difference is the mass. So the force per kg is higher. So the overall energy transfer into the child is a lot more. And because the skeleton is more pliable, it's probably not going to get fractured and there still be there still may be a lot of uh, solid organ injury burden. Next you need to understand that the surface area to volume ratio in kids makes it such that hypothermia is not only um, more likely it, it's likely like it will happen. If you do a secondary survey on a kid and you forget to put on the blanket for about 40 minutes and I don't know about you but to do a full primary and secondary survey and get the patient to CT, ICU, angio, or the OR, takes our team about 40 minutes. Like we do use up the golden hour, especially in 2020 when we're doing fast ultrasounds, we're putting in imaging guided lines, um, we're trying to give transexemic acid if they have evidence of bleeding. With all the adjuncts that we have, it does take 40 minutes to an hour to coordinate a final disposition to get the patient into the CT scanner or to get the patient into the operating room. It may not sound like it should take 40 minutes, but it does. And and that's the truth, right? And you also need to understand that there's a lot of psychological burden on the child and the caregiver. We'll talk about that a little bit more. I'm hoping to do uh, four different talks. This one, one on accidental versus non-accidental injuries and how to pick up on them. One on uh, near drowning, drowning, and neuroimaging, because those two kind of are gray zones that people aren't very good at, I find, and have a lot of questions about and uh, one specifically on PTSD in kids versus adults. And that might just be a PTSD post somewhere down the line on when to treat it, how to treat it clinically, and how to provide a support group for your patients and to begin to show them some support in, 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 the, in, in, in these conditions where the stress levels are very high. Anatomically, the key differences are a larger tongue leading to more airway obstruction a very high anterior larynx, so it's always higher than you think. If you're an adult intubator mainly, get a straight blade, right? They have a much larger occiput, so you should put the pad under the patient themselves, under their torso as opposed to under their head. You To snout them effectively, there should be a pad under their torso, right? And they're more likely to have head injuries, So, and the head injuries are going to have a quick deterioration. All the data shows that the lucid interval is longer, And the deterioration is quicker in most intracranial hemorrhages in kids, right? They lose their pliability very quickly, okay? And they have a much smaller torso, 
which means that especially at the younger extremes, you're less likely to have solid organ injuries, more likely to have head injuries. So this is what I mean by putting the pillow under them. It's so that you can align the spine in a manner that makes intubation more in line and also makes the uh, sort of Frank's larynx complex less anterior in a way. It's not that it's truly anterior. It's that you're dealing with a short neck with a narrow angle of movement, a narrow range of motion, right? That's your main problem. Your problem isn't an anatomically difficult or primarily anatomically difficult airway because of an airway anomaly, a structural anomaly. It's because of a different way of having to align the body to achieve the view that you expect. And I'd be cognizant of that. And yes, I would have a straight blade if you're an adult intubator. And you might even consider buying a pediatric video assisted laryngoscope or glidoscope. They do exist and they're pretty cheap. The other differences are that because of the larger head, you're more likely to get brain injuries. Because the skull is more pliable, you're less likely to look for them, right? Because the skull can, can contain a higher amount of bleeding, you're less likely to look for them. They also have a more compact body. So when they do get a torso injury or an abdominal injury, it's more likely to be thoracoabdominal. It's very hard to spare the lungs and hit the liver or spare the liver and hit the lungs. Usually they go hand in hand. Uh, because of the soft outer shell, don't expect to have pelvic fractures, spine fractures, or rib fractures as a warning sign that you should get a CT scan, right? Uh, more than likely, you're not going to have the fracture, but you may have the solid organ injury or lung contusion. And because they have uh, thinner skin and less fat, the interpretation of CT scans is a lot harder, but also they tend to lose uh, temperature a lot quicker. Physiologically, there are some changes as well. So vital signs are age-specific. Blood volume is about 80 ml per kg, so you can't eyeball blood loss in kids. Get that out of the way, right? And they have such a strong compensatory response that you're going to expect a sudden deterioration. And the harbinger of doom here, the, the thing that's going to tell you that they're, they're going to drop their pressure right now, is the fact that they have low glucose, right? They have higher metabolic demands. So this is typically what the cardiac output, heart rate, and blood pressure look like. Now... I don't expect you to look this up. I look these things up because I have no life. These are the things that I think about before bedtime, right? What do you notice on that curve? So what I notice looking at it is that you have a very high high rate variability up to a certain point with the blood pressure being stable. And then after that point, you crash. And typically what I hear is they were fine and then all of a sudden they became bradycardic. That's what I hear typically from junior members of staff where people aren't familiar with, with sort of what I call PEDS hemodynamics or dynamic hemodynamics, if, that, if PEDS hemodynamics wasn't confusing enough, right? And whenever I hear that type of thing, you know, I know that, that they're, they're starting to fall off that cliff, right? And they're, they're up to 45, 50% volume loss. So they're going to be going to the operating room soon if I don't get IV access, right? Which we'll talk about in a sec. So as they're falling off, you need to recognize it beforehand. So I would say when you have a 20% heart rate variability, give or take, that should be a warning sign to start intervening. And the use of crystalloids, latest studies have shown, negates the benefits of massive transfusion protocols. So I wouldn't even say judicious use of crystalloids, which is what the ATLS says. I'd say Give blood if you think that you need to give blood. Do not defer blood because of the risks of transfusion in children in the context of known hemorrhagic shock. How does that sound? So if you need to give blood, give it, and do not give crystalloid to avoid giving blood. And whenever you need to do it, use an IO or try and find a dedicated line. Give your blood through a separate line. We've kind of talked about this before earlier on in, in the podcast, but use an IO, right? It, it hurts me. When it literally gives me chest pain when I walk into an emergency room and I ask if they have IOs and the answer isn't a budgetary answer but it's that it's theoretical or that the evidence isn't so strong for them or that I can put it in a central line faster than you can put in an IO you probably can but the 20 other people that are working in your emergency room can't and if it's in ATLS and if it's in PALS and if you're dealing with kids in your emergency room then you need to have it so I don't understand the, the argument against buying some IOs and having them in the emergency room. They're now competing companies. Uh, 
Some of them even have manual drivers to put them in, so they're even cheaper. And they save lives. I'm sure that there'll be a study within the next five years that'll prove that just having an IO in the patient would benefit the patient's outcome. It may not save their lives. It might reduce the need for blood transfusions. It might increase the rate of salvageability of certain things, delay some operations, defer you from doing some operations maybe because you've resuscitated them adequately, but have the IO in place. Obviously, there are contraindications, but if you're dealing with a patient that's falling off the cliff, put an IO in to start the blood products. Okay. As you can see, there's a heart rate variability, and the diastolic is two-thirds of the systolic. Uh, typically, the way I'd calculate it is uh, 80 uh, plus the H times 2 is my systolic, and two-thirds of that is the, di is the uh, diastolic. It's very simple stuff. I personally learned off the formula when I was an intern. Um, you guys decide what you feel prudent uh, in using. I find that the chart is just too much for me to learn. And in the trauma bay, it just confuses me. So I just eyeball the age or ask the age. And then I do the calculation in my head. With thermoregulation, if you have warming blankets available, use them. If you don't warm the fluids that you give, warm the blood that you give, if you have the time to. Because warming blood takes longer than warming fluids, just because of the consistency. And because you, ideally, you'd like to use a special warmer for the blood, the one that's attached to a level one. And ideally, you should be giving it through a level one. But, you know, hypothetical things being what they are, you may not have all these things available to you in your emergency room. And so, therefore, if you can warm the fluids on a regular warmer, please try and do it. If you have an electric warmer, try and use it for the patient. And if you don't, then cover them as soon as you can. Now, we're not going to be going through the full ATLS algorithm as pertained to pediatrics. Those were just some exceptions. But don't forget to go through your full ATLS, including the adjuncts such as imaging and FAST. And remember, at every single one of the key components of the primary survey, there's a management issue specific to kids. So in the airway, they might obstruct easily due to the tongue. Try and use an uncuffed tube as well. For breathing, they may have a tension pneumothorax because of your intubation, if you're using an adult ambu bag. And you may not recognize it very early. Okay, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. In terms of vascular access, after the second attempt, put a jugular line or put a subclavian line. If you can't get those, put an IO in. Don't discuss it. Don't negate the outcome. Get a line in, okay? Check the pediatric GCS score documented on arrival prior to intubation. And remember, you can have diffuse swelling of the brain, and that can lead to a drop in GCS, and it may not appear as an isolated bleed in the CT scan. That's why I think it's important to talk about CT brains in a dedicated talk. And once you've intubated, about 50% of patients will have some gastric dilation. So put an OG or an NG tube in. Now, our focus today is going to be specifically on injury patterns and blunt trauma. And some of the gray zones we'll talk about a little bit later. I think I might do brain imaging on its own and drowning on its own. Because I think we can spend the extra 10 minutes on those. So in terms of mechanisms, the most common reason for a child to die is road traffic accidents and, ac and unintentional injuries worldwide, okay? The third most common is drowning. So first is uh, unintentional injuries. That's just a group, so I don't count it personally. The second is MVCs, and the third is drowning, okay? When you look at that group, falls and bikes are the vast majority of them. So patients falling and bikes. MVCs, I include ATVs or buggies as we call them here. And uh, burns, we're going to have to talk about on its own. But in general, burns also require some special care in pediatrics. But it'll be something that I'll talk about in a different uh, talk. So whenever you're looking at motor vehicle crashes, the role plays a role, pun intended. So um, whether it's the pedestrian or the kid is in the car makes a huge difference. When you're dealing with pedestrians, because chances are people are slowing down before they hit the kid, uh, you're more likely to have soft tissue contusions. And they're more likely to get their leg hit by a bumper or their arm hit by the windshield. So they're more likely to have extremity fractures if they're slow. If they're fast and they haven't seen them, the head is the most likely place that you're going to have an injury 
and about 30% of them will have a combined thoracoabdominal injury, mainly manifest in lung contusions. Uh, the third most common in high-speed pedestrian versus car are lower extremity fractures. When you're talking about occupants, the seatbelt makes a difference. When they're restrained, they're more likely to have lap complex injuries, such as missed bowel injuries, uh, typically manifest in CT scans with only free fluid and no solid organ injury. We'll talk about those in a sec. If they're unrestrained with no seatbelt, they're more likely to have head and spine injuries because that's where most of the mass is, and the momentum is going to project the head forward as the main point of impact inside the car. Similarly with bicycles, the helmet makes the biggest difference. If you don't have a helmet, you're more likely to have a head injury, a spine injury, or an upper extremity fracture as you extend your hands. If you do have a helmet, the handlebar will be the culprit in bicycles and motorbikes because the handlebar will impact on the liver, the spleen, the pancreas, and sometimes the duodenum. So handlebar injuries are, are almost notorious in pediatric surgery books. They're a typical injury pattern that all pediatric surgeons kind of understand. When you're dealing with falls, if they're from a low height, it's pretty much the same as pet versus car, low speed. Soft tissue contusions, upper extremity fracture as the patient extends their hands. If it's from a significant height, when I say significant height, remember, kids are not small adults. So you can't just say six feet or higher or pick a number. You're talking about the proportion of the child. So if they're falling from over twice the height of the child, then head, face, spine, and thoracoabdominal injuries are the most likely, and they're more likely to land on their feet and end up with long bone rather than calcaneal fractures. So historically in adults, if they fall on their feet from a significant height, they'll get calcaneal fractures if they survive. In kids, not the same. They'll get long bone fractures because the rest of their foot is soft enough to actually absorb some of the shock and project it into the long bones. When you talk about thoracic trauma, it's the second leading cause of death after the brain. Most of the time, it's, it's associated with a solid organ injury like we talked about. About 40 to 50 percent of the time. Up to 60 percent in older studies, right? You're more likely to have pulmonary contusions. If you have rib fractures, look for aortic injuries and look for attention pneumothorax like this one. Once these are in place, the chest is so pliable that you might not actually see it, right, until very late. As you can see, the, the pneumothorax is three times as big as the contralateral lung on the x-ray. Now, the people who are waiting for this x-ray shouldn't have waited for it. I agree with you. But something made them wait for it. It's either that the patient maintained their saturation or the patient maintained their vitals. So just like they were tricked, you might be tricked too. So if you're thinking about doing it, do it. Put the chest tube in. Okay. Tracheal bronchial injuries are extremely rare. But they're slightly more common than young children. The presentation is typically subcutaneous emphysema, neck hematomas might be visible, especially above the clavicle, all right? And um, they, they might be able, you might be able to see uh, uh, chest expansion issues that are asymmetrical, okay? The best way, quote unquote, to see them is to actually do a bronchoscopy. So a CT scan is not going to be very sensitive or specific for tracheobronchial injuries in adults or in children. And in fact, uh, there's a fair number of tracheobronchial injuries, especially if it's main stem, that require urgent operative intervention. So be on the lookout. Aortic injuries are very rare. Part of the reason is because we didn't look for them traditionally in the past. The other part is because, unfortunately, um, they die prior to coming into the hospital because of the low amount of circulating volume and the extremely high stroke volume. Like we talked about earlier, Kids have a significant amount of cardiac output that they can maintain for a while, despite bleeding. And so therefore, if you have a hole in the aorta, it's more likely to bleed more, unfortunately. Indications for an emergent thoracotomy. So ED thoracotomies are not well described in children, not as much as adults, okay? But emergent thoracotomies are well described, and that's why we're going through them. So massive air leak, ultrasound or clinical tamponade, Loss of vitals with penetrating injury, obviously an ED thoracotomy indication, and extremely high drainage, as calculated by 2 ml per kg over 2 hours, or 20 ml per kg in one shot. Whenever you have any penetrating injury across the nipple line, and I'll do a whole day about thoracoabdominal penetrating injuries, because people still find them difficult to, to understand, 
if you have any question of the bleeding not being from the lung, check the abdomen. If you do a fast ultrasound and you see free fluid in the abdomen, a fast positive abdomen with bleeding in the chest and it's a penetrating injury, check that you don't have a thoracoabdominal injury and the blood is draining up into the chest. It does happen. With abdominal trauma, recognize that the CT is harder to read, so give your radiologist a break. They're softer, they're thinner, they have less muscle mass and less fat. All the things that we look at to figure out if we have a bleeding, they have less of, okay? You're more likely to have multiple injuries. In penetrating, you should use the adult protocols, which we'll talk about, and usually they go to the OR. But in blunt, one thing that you have to recognize is there haven't been a lot of series about solid organ blunt injuries, okay? But in general, the chance to intervene and have a negative laparotomy in adults has an extremely low complication rate. In children, the quoted, and this is from the 1970s, it's a very small study, but the quoted negative laparotomy rate might reach 90% in adult surgeon hands. Okay? And in addition to that, the 10-year mortality associated with it is 1.6%, and the morbidity is about 1 in 5, largely adhesions, okay, and admissions for small bowel obstruction. So it has to be recognized that in kids under the age of 13, 14, a negative laparotomy might be more significant than an adult. That doesn't mean that you should wait more than 24 hours, because the studies and the literature show that free fluid in the abdomen in the context of no solid organ injuries or only a solid organ injury of the pancreas that's isolated, the free fluid in the abdomen is a very significant predictor of a missed bowel injury. The good news is that you have up to 24 hours to assess the patient, do serial abdominal exams, serial lactates, things like this, and then eventually make the decision. But you should not defer it for more than 24 hours. If within 24 hours the kid isn't happy and playing with a normal lactate, normal base deficit, normal labs, normal white count, no fever, and ready to eat ice cream, if they're not that happy, then I would consider a DL under these circumstances. Because, again, operating on them directly right off the bat in some series, 70% to 90% negative laparotomy rate. Waiting for 24 hours as per the reference that I put down here, does not increase morbidity or mortality. Understanding that there may be a missed bowel injury despite of or because of a solid organ injury, okay, in conjunction with the solid organ injury in children will help you make that decision. The decision will by and large be based on the CT scan obviously, Otherwise, how would we know about the solid organ injuries and the free fluid? But we'll also have to be made based on clinical judgment. There is no utility to repeating the CT scan in 24 hours. Unless you're looking for a pseudoaneurysm in a solid organ injury, there is no utility in repeating it in 24 hours. Okay? And there's a lot of discrepancy in what centers do for follow-up imaging for solid organ injuries. Okay? Some centers wait for five days. Some centers don't do repeat imaging. Some centers do repeat ultrasound. And some centers do repeat CT angio in a week. It's very hard to tell which you should do. In terms of pelvic fractures, they're extremely rare, but with a high mortality and a great potential for disability. More than likely, there'll be multiple fractures. 60% of the time, there'll be multiple fractures. And fixation is very common. Spinal cord injuries are mainly ligamentous. It's almost unheard of in somebody under the age of six to have a true blue fracture. It's usually ligamentous. And that's why if you have any pain across the neck, especially the higher cervical vertebra, it might be prudent to do an MRI before clearing the C-spine. Now, there are certain gray zones that people try and, and, and create a controversy in, but it's not really that controversial, especially if you're in the driving seat. If you're the TTL and you're dealing with a sick kid, you'll know that you're dealing with a sick kid just by checking your own heart rate. And you can quote me on that. You yourself will be sick while dealing with a sick kid. First one, should I get the PAN scan or not? So 
yes, the jury's still out on PAN scans in general. And yes, radiation risk in kids is higher than in adults. But the radiation from traveling to Atlanta, from Kuwait and back, is higher than the radiation from a PAN scan. So whenever you take your kids with you to Florida, or to Vegas, or to Disneyland, and you're traveling for 16 hours, the amount of radiation that you're exposing them to is worse than a PAN scan. Okay? You need to understand this. Now, when I read something like this, whole body CT scan for children after trauma, undefined efficacy with clear cancer risks, what they quote is clear cancer risks, if you look at the, the actual references, and this is open source, this is all over the place, um, is literally, so the first, let's look at the references, all right? You, I'll leave you to read the article. First reference says that PAN scans will help you detect missed injuries, but not in a significant way that you couldn't detect with observation. The second one is a guideline development group for major trauma. And it's based on nice guidelines analysis, so cost-benefit analysis in the BMJ. So that's not even like a study study, right? The REACT2 trial was the only randomized trial done for the studying the subject. And what they found was most of the patients who ended up getting segmental scanning got a completion PAN scan afterwards, okay? If you read the fine print, that's what really happened. Most of the patients cost the hospital more money because they were being observed for longer, declared themselves with symptoms, and ended up with a PAN scan that showed missed injuries as well, okay? They say that it's unequivocal and that having a PAN scan policy won't make a difference because the logic here is, and get this, because we crossed over to doing completion PAN scans, in the vast majority, we still left a percentage that had less radiation overall. And so that's why maybe PAN scans might not work, right? You know, it's ridiculousness. Uh, the cancer risk in 68,000 people uh, exposed to uh, tomography scans in childhood and adolescence was a, a case control retrospective match trial, and it didn't show a significant difference, right? It was a data linkage study, and they cherry-picked uh, 68,000 people to case match from 11 million. So if I pick 68,000 people to match with my 68,000, from 11 million, how representative is that of real world statistics in 2020, right? And number five, radiation exposure from CT scans in childhood uh, might lead to leukemia. It's a re retrospective cohort study. So there's no comparison with a second group. There's a comparison with the general population, which may or may not be correct. So overall, two out of the five references actually point to kids. Of the two, none of them are RCTs that they expect us to do to prove whole body CT scanning works in trauma. Now, when you look at centers that do PAN scans and centers that deal with pediatric trauma as adult centers dealing with kids or as kid centers dealing with trauma. So children's hospitals that deal with trauma versus adult hospitals that deal with kids. Right? Although there's a variability of use in general, in adult centers, we're more likely to order CT scans, okay? In kid centers, they're more likely to be admitted for observation. So the adult centers were less likely to admit the child, but the pediatric centers were more likely to admit the child. And in the adult center, the reason why they feel like they can discharge the child confidently is because of the fact that we did a CT and it showed that there's no injuries. Again, people are looking at the wrong marker. If somebody is at high risk, and if somebody comes in unstable, I'm not going to take them for a CT scan. I'm going to do a laparotomy on them, or a thoracotomy, or a burr hole. I'm not going to do a whole body CT scan in a hemodynamically unstable patient. When you group hemodynamically unstable and hemodynamically stable patients in your analysis, expect to get no difference in mortality risk. So, in general, Tracking mortality is very hard to do in trauma, retrospectively or prospectively. The fragmented nature of pediatric trauma care means that you can't get direct conclusions from any single study. 
in centers where we are willing to accept a missed injury rate, you can advocate for not doing PAN scans on kids and admit them for observation or send them home with instructions. You can. But all of the data seems to point to the fact that if you have a whole body CT scan policy in your center, your missed injury rates would be lower and your average hospital stay will be lower, especially in your emergency room. There are no clear criteria in children, but there is a clear role in hemodynamically stable or partial responders in trauma. These examples might include unwitnessed mechanisms or patients who are unevaluable. So although I wouldn't be as liberal as I would with adults, I think that there is a role for PAN scanning in kids. And, you know, the data is getting better and better every day. Granted, this isn't the best, but it's actually a pretty good study. And it does show you will pick up on unexpected injuries. Thank you for listening. Um, and please subscribe. Uh, hopefully this won't be the last pediatric lecture that we do. Um, and, you know, lots to go through there. Kids aren't small adults. This is Saad Al-Zaid, and thank you for listening.